Hello and welcome. My name is Nathan Howe and I'm Department Head of Interior Architecture and Industrial Design. And today we have our first of this academic year's ECDAL lectures. Our Dean Tim DeNoble unfortunately could not be with us today and sends his regrets. If you do not know, the Oscar S. Ekdal Distinguished Lecture Series in Architecture Planning Design brings the finest professionals in the design and planning disciplines to AP Design and the K-State community. These individuals are selected to avail faculty, staff, students, and regional professionals to the potency of design and planning in addressing the issues we face as a global society. The series honors Oscar Ekdal, who received his Bachelor of Architecture from Kansas State University in 1933 and was a founding partner in Ekdal Davis DePew Pearson Architects PA in Topeka, Kansas. Just so you know, the uh, format of this lecture will be, uh, I'll be introducing Andreas, but you'll be able to put into the YouTube channel uh, any questions you might have that sparked during the, the lecture. So feel free to put those in, I'll be monitoring them and then um, I will we'll open up the questions at the end. So join us today. I have the honor of introducing a wonderfully accomplished award-winning industrial designer and president of Teams Chicago office, Andreas Bell. Teams is a global design firm with studios located in Stuttgart, Ham Hamburg, Chicago, Belgrade and Shanghai. As an international firm, Teams has developed product for Bosch, Dremel. Uh, in fact, the uh, 3D printers that we have downstairs uh, in Rainier Seton Hall are, are, were designed at his, uh, at his firm. They've also worked with Bessel, Mr. Coffee, Intel, Pyrex, Statler, to name just a few international companies in their portfolio. Andreas Bell was educated as an industrial designer in Germany and completed his master's degree in industrial and product design at the University of Kansas as a Fulbright scholar. To show how the state of Kansas left its indelible mark on Andreas when assistant professor Dr. Macon Elchilyu asked him to come speak to you, he said it would be great to come back home. While we would have loved to have brought him back physically home for this lecture, due to COVID, that experience has been relegated as many experiences have been these days to a virtual one. I'm sure in the post COVID world, hopefully sooner than later, we can and will invite Andreas back for a more immersive and personal visit so he can see our amazing facility and the incredible talent of student and faculty that we have and enjoy at AP Design. I have only had the pleasure of a brief visit and virtual coffee with Andreas thus far, but I am sure you will find as I did that even after a brief encounter, the warmth and genuine nature of the man aligns and resonates with the kind of people we hope to work with and be mentored by through our journey as designers for tomorrow. Without further ado, please help me welcome to our virtual podium to present his lecture, Means to an End, Design Process in the Field, Andreas Bell. Well, thank you, Nathan. I've unmuted myself now, and I'm very humbled, I must say. I didn't expect that kind of introduction. So here I am. Andreas is my name, and I'm uh, the president over here, but by nature, I'm a designer, industrial designer, been um, trained like that and been working in the field um, for quite a while now. And I want to kind of give back a little bit by engaging in those kind of wonderful events uh, like this one. So today we have very little time. This is basically the length of an extended phone call that I would normally have with a client. Um, so I want to make sure that we put everything at the right places. I have bit of a PowerPoint prepared for you guys that we can go through. So I'll switch from the video feed right now onto my screen and keep your fingers crossed that all my tech is checking out. So we should in a few moments see my screen. And um, with that, I can now kind of walk you through what we're gonna be doing. So it looks long for about uh, 50, 60 minutes that we have. I wanna make sure we have enough time at the end to have that Q and A really curious about the questions you have. I'll be telling you a little bit about my path to design. We're gonna look into some of the work examples and I'm not gonna show you the entire team's work portfolio because that'll be exhaustive. 
uh, what I'm really curious uh, about showing you is process, tools of the trade, project basics, means to an end. This is where the title comes from, right? Because there are those tools, uh, there's a ton of tools. What are the right ones uh, for the right moment? What could we learn right now as you guys are still studying? And then show and tell at the end, that's the section I'm most scared of because uh, I'm not sure if I manage all my tech well and if I've learned the kinds of things I should have learned in my 20 years of the industry, but we'll see how it goes. So a bit of a, you know, going from a sketch uh, all the way into a presentations, hopefully in a couple of minutes. Okay, everybody, um, I believe Mary from your newsletter team, she asked me, how did I make it into design? What caused that? So in 1979, I was, um, I wanna say I was five years old and I ended up sitting on the lap of my uncle and he was using some pencils and some paper that he found. And he sketched me this little sketch and it took him probably about a minute. He just invented this environment in front of my eyes. And then he grabbed uh, two of my color or four, three of my color pens and just filled it in very, very quickly. And I was awestruck. I, I knew that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be as good as he was creating the sketch for me. So I practiced and I got into um, this kind of mode. I had no idea about design. It took me a whole bunch of years, you know, and I went through three different schools. Um, I, I also, you know, have five workplaces up my sleeve uh, that I've seen that I work for. Currently, it's about 28 sketchbooks. Um, didn't put all the dots down here, but um, you know, I kept sketchbooks all the way through my career, and um, go back sometimes and see what what I've done. And then, um, you know, oodles and oodles of hours of just work and training and practice. So that doesn't go away. That's what we got to do. But I'm still, I think I'm still a happy designer. You know, I, en I enjoy that job ever since. I have never tired of it. But it's certainly not an uh, eight to five job. Right? It's, it's really taken the whole thing of, of everybody. And I selected my tools um, pretty early on. I'm, I'm, I was kind of an analog guy. I was scared of computers um, until I think 97 or so when I really finally had to because I became an intern and I had to kind of start learning Macintosh and all of that. But to this day, I love my pencils and my pen and a bit of watercolor. You know, you can use this in an airplane. People will look at you. They think you're going to put a syringe into your veins, but no, it's a nice little pen. You can do some art and there will be like, they, they want to take pictures out of your sketchbook as you do that. So try to remember those traditional means. Sometimes they're kind of good because uh, you don't need electricity. You don't need anything for it. Now, 1995 came on and this was my first job. And I was just blown away that somebody even let me do this, you know. I was asked by a friend and his father actually worked for the Mice in China Works, um, the first white porcelain factory in Europe. One of the prestigious um, places, extremely traditional and um, the, the kinds of stuff that they're producing you can't even afford. Uh, and it's not necessarily design stuff, but they came to me and they wanted me to develop car motifs that Mercedes-Benz would finally buy. They would buy a series of these plates as some advertisement. And um, I was just, blown away by that request. I had no idea what a quote was. I had no idea how much time I will take for making these pictures that would go onto those plates. I was asked not to use any other color but a specific type of watercolor blue. Can I even do that was the question. But I was naive enough to say yes to it. And I had my first job under my wings and I was extremely proud of it. Now, from there, of course, years go by, practice, training, and so forth. Uh, the first professional experience has come along. And um, I just want to show you one project. This was before Teams. I worked for the public uh, railway industry and also uh, the bus manufacturers, everything in the public transport space. And um, at some point, I ended up working in Berlin at an agency that had a lot of Chinese jobs um, going on at the time. And I was there for about three years um, before this job came along. And I was put on that team as the lead of our team just because of my English knowledge. I returned from Kansas. My English was pretty up to snuff. People in the team didn't speak as much English, but we had to deal with a Chinese team. So again, I was immensely proud of it, but it really took us quite some time to really work it out in detail, to build the prototypes full scale, collaborate with other people, in order to make that happen. But the coolest paycheck of all of this is really when something that you work on actually makes it onto 
onto the track in this case or becomes a reality. So I'm still uh, quite proud of this. That train is running around in China, um, Chenying, two miles from um, Beijing. So a cool story, a cool memory. Next one, and this is Teams now. So another couple of years go by and uh, I'm getting involved in product design. You know, the difference between a train and these things is about an inch and a half in welding tolerances. Product design doesn't, doesn't like, you know, many uh, changes in dimensions. Everything is precise. Everything is by the tens and thousands of the millimeters. You have to kind of change your game entirely. And with Teams, really, I truly dived into design, product design, product strategy, product development uh, in, in the greater scheme of things. And uh, this program wasn't the first one that was given to me. So at Teams, I was already um, on the senior designer level. So eventually I was put on that team as um, the lead designer and also communicator with the client. And we were developing conference units for the security uh, systems for Bosch. Uh, quite a complex project, uh, it took us about three years to make that happen. But again, the absolute biggest reward was finally seeing our product here in the UN with uh, people like Obama using our product. We had no idea that this was gonna happen, but as soon as that picture appeared, it just made the rounds in our studio and we were just happy as little children. You know, It didn't matter how much energy we spent, how much time it took us to develop this um, tech device that was asked to be kind of a gesture on the table. They didn't want to have another telephone on the tables. They wanted to have something more sculptural. So it took us a while, but this is really the biggest reward. So money and time isn't everything. It's usually more like the appreciation of something that you're working on. Next subject, and that's another couple of years. And this is also my transition here to the US. Um, so in 2016, we started engaging in a um, kind of a competition we had no idea what sort of chance we would have because um, it was by an optics company. An optical company asked for an anal um, analyzing device for the human eyesight. And um, we were really uh, trying to scramble, putting together uh, something that we could submit, knowing that we probably didn't have a chance. Uh, the request was something ultimately cheap, you know, $5 for the product, and it had to go into any corner of this world where you don't have any access to any tech or any electricity had to be cheap, had to be uh, durable, and it had to be precise enough to diagnose people uh, without eye care, to find out what sort of um, eye care problem they have. So we were lost in the weeds with tons and tons of questions. We knew throughout that entire process that we probably didn't stand a chance, but eventually the, the company saw what we were doing and the kind of enthusiasm that we brought to the table, and they uh, awarded the price to us in order to allow us to then full-blown develop this product for them and with them. So we engaged with their optics people and um, really kind of went to town and developed each and every detail. But the essence of it stayed the same. It's still a very simple device, very humble. Um, it's useful. It uh, is now launched. This was the um, another UN report about this product coming out and um, the sort of um, greatness it would do. So this project I selected because it's one of those ideal projects. Not only do you get to work on usability and design development, but you're doing something good for the world, right? You, you're trying to improve the world. And as you're young, you have that, that drive for it. And with this project, we really had the chance. It was not really commercial. It was more about, hey, can we help 2.5 billion people to improve their eyesight? So pretty exciting stuff. And the best part of my entire career is really that you're never alone in what you're doing. Um, you're always working as a teammate uh, among other people. And that team might be com coming from your client side. That team might be your, your best mate at school. Or, you know, in our case here, we have 100 designers and they're spread around the world. And we work actively together with them. So here, one example, I, I was flown to Tokyo and uh, Shanghai last year. Um, for a huge endeavor, a global um, visual brand language development uh, for Hitachi, massive uh, amount of work again. And we pulled in three studios of ours because the request was you know, looking at multiple countries, multiple continents. And the client was looking for international people, native people to the very continent. 
and that's how we got to work on something like that because we are a globally operating design house we're not just saying it we're truly doing it so sometimes within like a week's notice you you've been told you know what you got to fly to some place i mean these days that's a little different but um in the olden days uh, we would immediately jump to action if the client would ask us so this was really a, a very cool uh program I want to move on because what's more important to you guys probably is so what's the kind of stuff you need to have you need to learn you need to deal with um, in your career and um, I'm showing you these things uh, and most of you are probably familiar with that because you guys are American English speakers I am not I'm from Germany I have to like pick up the pieces learn what all this stuff means so as a student I would encourage you guys just try to learn the vocabulary try to pick up those words try to understand what they mean and when they you know, play a role in the design process. For instance, a request for quote uh, comes along. People are asking you for an RFQ, meaning they want you to tell them what kind of cost do you need for a certain type of process. Statement of work, SOW. Quote, quotation, proposal, project outline, roadmap. This is really the kind of, when, when you hear that and somebody asks you for that sort of thing, you wanna be really quite careful what you're putting in there because that's the kind of contract, that's the thing you are uh, working um, towards, and um, this is um, the one thing that is binding and it's really gonna guide you through a process. It'll make or break you depending on uh, how you've written it and how well you're able to evaluate how much time you need for a certain part of the process. Non-disclosure agreement and so forth and so forth. So lots of words, lots of abbreviations, but I'm just showing you that slide to start your collection now and ask those questions to your professors, to the professionals you're working with, to really get a feeling for what is later on waiting for you out in the business world. So let's not stress this too much. I want to show you an example of one of our timelines. So this is a very simplified version, but every project that we're doing, the clock's always ticking. And we have to be able to tell our client, you know, which phase are we in? What calendar week is this going to happen? Are we gonna make it to the quality gate to that red line? Will we have the deliverables to make it over to the next step? Because each and every step that is lined out here is also a part of, of your payment that you are receiving. So you gotta be very organized and sort of like learn structure a project into different pieces. But so this is kind of the theoretical bit, the scary bit, but the fun bit still remains, right? You wanna be able to use your pen because you won't always have a computer that is at hand and can do things for you. Uh, sometimes you are very bare and in front of your client and you've got to make it happen, right? They're going to look at you. You have a whiteboard, it's glossy and it's literally like ice skating, right? Um, but what you can tell yourself is your client usually is not visually trained so you can do better than them and that will encourage you to, to move on. I told you about my sketchbooks. Maybe we'll see a few more pieces later on as we're going through this lecture. But uh, quick and dirty and kind of collecting your thoughts in the form of sketches, either during meetings or during phone calls, you know, try to understand the person that talks to you and um, what they're saying about something and start creating your little storyboard. You know, this person, for instance, we were, we were asked by an outdoor company to create um, that kind of furniture, you know, foldable chairs. And these are really literally the initial first thoughts about, all right, what can we do with a chair like that? And who is going to be sitting in it? So try to identify with your user, uh, not just on a theoretical level, but really, you know, make a little sketch, make that gesture as if somebody is really having a good time in that chair, because with that, your, you know, fluids in your brains are starting to create the ideas that will later on lead to executions. So this is, you know, what I'm using my sketchbook for. I'm being quick and dirty, I'm collecting, I'm gluing things into it that is related to the program, but I'm also trying to figure things out for myself. Sometimes, you know, I have to be very informative, you know, with an image like, like this, for instance, you know, a cross-section drawing, schematics, try to learn these things right now because later on they will help you a great deal, especially nowadays, everything is remote. I have to be able to quickly send something across the fence, um, with a text message or with an email. So these pictures are usually gold dust in the eyes of your clients, because first of all, they can draw. Secondly, an image is a thousand words, so they can immediately show that to somebody else and you will get feedback. They will tell you, um, I'd like it like this, but I don't like it like that. So it's a great means of communication. 
And once the quick and dirty is, is done, you go into a more systematic gathering of information. So quick and dirty can then be cleaned up. You end up um, you know, really sorting the kinds of pieces of information in maybe a form of a user journey. So you have your, the way the user goes through a process, you identify the joy and the pain points. And, and that's really the key, right? I mean, you, you don't do a user journey just because for the user journey's sake. No, you wanna understand what is it that is currently unsatisfactory to the user. And with that, you already have your ideas. So you don't have to go back into another room and, and then try to scramble for ideas. Those ideas come out of these tools, right? So that, that is the sole purpose of it. It's not because somebody wants to have a pretty picture that looks like this on the wall. No, we want to really say, all right, these are the 10 cool ideas, but we can only do five for the first quarter of the year. So these are the first five, and then we move on. So you start building roadmaps with these types of plans. So again, visual. Another piece of encouragement I can only give you now is to try to organize a meeting yourself, you know, and try to be the lead in that meeting, try to cater for other people and host other people, learn that kind of part of the trade as well, because that's what you'll be doing. Usually as a designer, we always end up being that kind of show in front of other people. We go into a marketing department, they sit and lean back and they leave the driving to us. So we have to be prepared, we have to have our stuff ready. And we need to be prepared to a point that we make that meeting the biggest value for us, right? I want to drive answers to my questions out of all these people in the room. And I can only do that if I have a good structure. So it's a good thing to sort of practice that, you know, talk in front of your peers, um, be not afraid, just, and with practice comes, comes a mastership at, at some point. Again, um, you know, we, we do a lot of collaborative workshops. Um, Working together with people is important. Sometimes it can be a little intimidating, but it's also interesting how, you know, certain strengths kind of come out of the weeds. You know, some people are good at making a quick model during the workshop. The other person is better making that quick sketch that the client is, is going to have, have to have. And then the next person is helping to deal with everything that was made in the meeting that was quick and dirty, kind of later on cleaning it up and uh, making it more palatable and more useful for um, higher end purposes. So that's uh, another service. We build a lot of prototypes. Um, this is Jerry working on a, a very interesting project. So we deal with cheese, but we're not dealing really with the cheese itself. We're dealing with heating cheese up in proper ways. And so Jerry is one of those wonderful people. He is an industrial designer, but he came to us with an electronics degree from uh, McDonnell Douglas. So he's actually been working on avionics and electronics. Then he started studying design. Now he's a hybrid and now we, we are fortunate to have him because with people like him, you can kind of play multiple or, or fight multiple battles, right? And I can converse with him about a certain heat element and he will have the answer for me, which is extremely helpful to have. And he asked me what sort of um, sketch style should I use in order to make this exploded view a little fancier, right? So we have that give and take which is wonderful because I have no idea about bits and bytes and electronics. And he wants to learn more about, you know, sculpting, shaping, using the right kind of um, visualization technique. So if you guys are hybrids, nothing wrong with it. The opposite is the case, you know, and you cannot be uh, strong in all the fields, but kind of look at your strength. Sometimes you really also want to be extremely neat. So our clients, they ask us for philosophy booklets, um, publications, um, and that's the only result from the project. We're not designing the item that is depicted here. We are designing the corporate publication for them. So the neater, the better is really applicable here, right? We, we have to be um, laying out that content in a juicy, but also technically correct way. And projects like that, they go through many editions and um, rounds of um, you know, shuffling the pictures around before it really starts coming to light. But um, presentation is really key in that case because in the end, it's nothing but a PDF or a booklet. So when you see it as that, it, it doesn't really have too much value. But if you present it the right way, the value increases and it becomes something that you can actually truly sell for what it is. So sometimes very important, you know, quick and dirty is important, but also um, being neat has its place when the right time comes along. 
And now this is this was faster than I thought. This is great. So we can actually now kind of um, try something out together because I, I haven't done that before, to be honest with you, uh, in this sort of setting. So what I'll first try to do, I'm going to go back to my to my um, stop sharing um, so that we can actually see the camera again. So hopefully you guys can see me. And um, the first part of this project or process, so I want to kind of show you um, a few bits and pieces of my kinds of toolbox. So the first challenge is to rotate my camera down here. First challenge um, has been mastered. Now the next one is cameras upside down, but I still want to zoom in. I guess that's not going to happen, but I don't think we, we can do fine with that. So uh, if you can still hear me and if you can see this, hopefully, um, I guess I should turn this the other way around. Oh, beautiful. So everything works out today. It's one of those good days. So this is uh, really what I would love to use. And um, oftentimes on the phone, uh, that's all you have because you cannot start up your Wacom and deal with all of that good stuff. So my favorite, um, even though they don't smell good, a good Sharpie, it doesn't matter if it's full or not, I'll have a medium liner and then I have my roller pen. So th these are basically the three categories of, um, I may have lost my screen share. Can you still see me? Uh, no. Oh, hang on, this is terrible. So somebody, somebody jumped into this um, using my phone for a call. How silly. So I think we're back now, right? Yep. So now imagine the client calls you and they, they want something from you. You have to immediately come up with, a, with an idea. So, uh, you know, let's say they, they have an RFID chip. They want to plug something into it. They, they want some sort of thing from you and you start scribbling along as they're talking. And that scribble shouldn't take too much time. So they want something round and scroundle-ish. And maybe there is some sort of um, you know, cable outlet right there. And you don't have time, so you have to be fast. Maybe they're talking about some sort of window up here. You know, maybe there's some a bit of a line right there. And during these moments, um, with my thin pen, because I'm also scared, I'm not sure what I'm doing, you know, you, you can still kind of mess up and they can blabber into your ear and um, nobody gets hurt. Now this thing is um, kind of looking as what they described to you. Maybe you now kind of like um, give them the outer edge so it becomes a little more and so forth and so forth. Um, and I'm still within a minute right now. So a minute has been spent and we have our first design kind of sketch almost ready. And then, you know, if you want to really be fancy because the client just left the room and went for a coffee you just give them the Sharpie, you drop a shadow underneath, like so. You know, simple shadow, bit of cross hatching. I shouldn't shake too much because I've learned that my phone starts shaking up on my boom. So a bit of that. And then you wow the client by using a white pencil and you give them like a bit of a highlight. And then they, oh wow, this guy can really draw. Right, so this is the initial icebreaker. This is the thing that you give them for free because um, they haven't signed the contract yet, but they kind of feeling you out as they're calling you or as they're watching what you're doing. So you show them, all right, this guy understands what I'm saying. This guy actually follows along and he now even puts the LED light in where it belongs. So your client can immediately give you feedback on this little piece of paper. And your clients will waste a ton of post-it notes by just putting a word on it. But a post-it note is a beautiful thing. You can have an entire array of artwork on it, you know. And of course, I've been I've been cheating um, since I knew that we guys were going to have a meeting. But you just saw I spent about a minute, and you can spend six minutes, and all of a sudden you have an array of products that all have something with uh, to do with each other. They're all squandles, and um, they could be seen as kind of a family of products. And here we are. I should probably turn my camera around. Again, might be better to see. That's what I wanted to show you. So here you are in uh, no matter, like, like very little time and uh, with a few tools, you've created a first set that you could now, if you polish it up a little, sell to your client. So now I'm gonna try this experiment again. I'm gonna go back to the other environment. 
so that we can actually play a little bit on the computer together. And um, so we were right there. Show and tell, right? So we've, um, we've gone for our quick phone sketch and this was great. The client's happy, they're signing the contract. Um, now um, we have that set. We've cleaned up our post-its a tiny bit so they become sellable, right? I mean, this is presentable. You can send it out um, and they'll be happy and they'll be giving you more feedback because you've been putting in all that information. Now, of course, if you really want to impress Target, for instance, you have to up the game, up, up the game. You cannot go to Target, to a merchant at Target and sell them a hand sketch like this. They're going to laugh at you. They're going to send you home. You have to have something like this. But your client doesn't want to pay for half a year of development time. So we, we got to be somehow fast and furious to make this happen. And for that, I, I have a few things prepared for you that I want to, that I want to show you real quick. So we're now um, switching over to a different application. Hopefully this checks out here on my side. So we got to model this up, right? And I'm a modeler in Rhino. I'm sure you guys are 360 um, geeks and you know all this other virtual reality stuff that I don't know, um, not yet. Um, but so if I'm being asked to come up with something very quick like this, then the first thing that I'll do, I start digging around. And you know, the client talked about a charging cable. So obviously I'm gonna to go to my, to my library and I'm gonna find myself a pre-model charging cable that I may have used for a different project. Very simple. Then the client has a name. In our case, the name is Eggdoll. I can easily and simply throw a logo in it by just using my text tools and creating a, a nice little logo for them. And then I use surfaces. I really just, um, you know, created that name. Let me just try to get my text box in here. Bear with me, it just got lost somewhere on my free screens. I think down here it is. So you just type whatever you want. Comes in as curves, super easy, but you can also select, you know, surfaces right away. So that's where it is. Huge egg doll, you can take it. And um, now I've got to relax a little bit because we have time. Wanted to show you this is one of my favorites during Rhino modeling. Um, there's that pop-up menu, which shows up if you use your middle mouse button. So it pops up, it is usually empty. Like there's about four different functions in here, but you can populate this by simply dragging and dropping and dropping any kind of function from all these different palettes into this kind of uh, environment. And um, that really makes your, makes your uh, modeling experience much faster. So what we need now is some sort of scaling device, um, scale it down um, and then make it, make it fit. But I would also recommend not to, you know, not to trim any surfaces or try to cut these letters into whatever uh, shape you're dealing with because that's too much time. And um, it actually makes your model more complex, makes your surfaces less stable. So now we have uh, two different options. Um, let's just move the other one away and um, got to look at it from three dimensions. Always make sure your projection is on as you're moving things around. So I'm just simply letting um, this piece of geometry hover over my untrimmed geometry like so with a bit of air in between, but it's not gonna matter because in the end, it will be believably flying over where I wanna be, just like that. And um, as you start shading it, we're not gonna see much. Everything is just in that particular kind of gray and we're all living on one layer right here. Now, what I really enjoy about Rhino, and especially when it comes to a time crunch, are two things. Um, one is taking high resolution screenshots with a command that's called minus view capture. It's really weird why it's called minus view capture to file, but I guess uh, programming didn't have enough um, names. You have the ability to browse. You can um, browse to wherever you want to. You can write this in many different file formats. PNG is my favorite because it comes with a transparent background, which is really cool. So we're writing a test here. We're gonna take a high res screenshot. Let's do a test two in the case. 
And now this is the fancy bit. You can key in the kinds of pixel ratio you'd like to have. So in this case, I'm writing a screenshot with 6,000 by 6,000 uh, pixel screens, uh, screen pixels, which is really great. Because if I was to take a normal screen capture, I would end up with something rather fuzzy. So um, in every good TV kitchen, everything's prepared already. So I've done the, the, the bit already. So this would be a, an ordinary screen capture if you were to just simply use your keyboard button. You'll see it's fuzzy, it's not cool, especially in close-ups. This is something you don't want to present. So you'd have to draw over it. But um, if you take this um, with the function that I just mentioned to you, minus view capture, you can actually really up up the game very quickly and um, get yourself something of much higher res, looking extremely crisp and sharp. And this whole process, so if we compare this size to this picture, we see the difference immediately. This process is not a rendering, it's just a screenshot, but it takes you about a minute to make it happen. Whereas digging out Keyshot or Moto or whatever Maxwell you want to use, it'll take you much longer to come up with a good picture. Now there's other um, things that we used to use in the past. So I want to talk about a little bit material application. So right now everything is on this one material and nothing really funky going on. You can now um, obviously assign materials um, by using this little button back here. You can click on it and you give that layer a particular material. In this case, I'm using a nice orange uh, that comes from a library of images. It's called Oxpacker. And these are nothing but, um, you know, screenshots or uh, not screenshots, um, images. So simple bitmaps that are being used now as material applications. You can throw them on, they'll end up here. They're called environment map. So that material is in Rhino now. It's not really on the geometry. So we'll put that on and we'll end up with our really nice rendered item like this. But now there's other materials involved. And since I don't want to create new layers, I'm just selecting bits and pieces of the geometry and I can assign more materials by using, um, for some reason I cannot select anything. Let's just see what the problem might be. Oh, there we go, because we're still in that, in that screenshot mode, which we can kill now. So um, it takes a little bit to whittle. Now, if we were to select an object within that layer, we can do the same thing, assign a material by looking at the properties. And in the properties, we have that object area. So we can assign either to layer or we can assign to an object. And with that, we can now select more materials. So this whole Oxpecker environment is, is really cool because you have a whole bunch of you know, plastics, rubbers, metals, and so forth. So in my case, I, I had a chrome on it, but maybe let's do some copper. I'm going to put some copper on it. And now we can go back and, and check it out if our copper has arrived. And sure enough, it has arrived. It's kind of a matte sort of tonality, kind of nice. And then the same went on with Ekdal, you know, another material um, that has been assigned as an object. So you can very quickly turn your otherwise bleak looking geometry in a shaded mode. You can turn it into a really nice looking image by using the material assignment um, functionality within Rhino, just using this button back here to give these different pieces, different materials. So if for some reason we wanted to have the uh, AKD as something that is now coming in in white, we just say default material we're finding ourselves a nice white. There's a nice white plastic out here, but I have my folder for Ekdal already existent. So let's do this. Let's put that on and see what it looks like. So I'm showing you this because um, as you're modeling something, you can immediately test how your geometry will impact the way a certain material comes out. You know, let's say we have like a gloss lacquer, a gloss overlay onto that orange rubber and we get that kind of shimmer and in a meeting with your client that you might have online, you can impress them very quickly, but this will also lead to a great image, All right? So later on, um, as we have taken that screenshot with the minus view capture command, and we're ending up in Photoshop, we're having our image and that's cool. It's already a transparent background. It's a nice high res. 
Now, what I usually do if I don't have time, I just duplicate this. I'm going to use that bottom layer now, and I'm going to use my control U command, which uh, really gets me into this fun little playroom for all the colors. So that lo uh, lower layer now is colored differently. I get to drop it a little bit any way I want to. And if I was going to make a funky little poster, I could use that in this black sort of shading kind of mode as it is. If I wanted to be a little less aggressive, I just use my transparency. And on top of it, I'm going to give it a blur. Not too much because distance isn't too far, right? We don't want to blur it too much. But if you do that, you know, all of a sudden, we've added some complexity and it starts looking more like a rendering, even though it has started out as a screenshot. And we do that a bit more. So we duplicate it one more time and do the control U thing again, turn that into a black environment. And now we just move that lower layer for about a pixel or two. And all of a sudden we get some kind of sketch outline. Really nice. And if you don't like black, we can always like go back, uh, control U it again and turn it into maybe a bit of a gray. Um, if you like that better, less aggressive. And we can do this another time so duplicate and um, move this next layer, maybe a few pixels up. But on the upside, that's where the sun is. That's where the light comes in. So there we just do a control I and we reverse that layer. And we now have it nicely white. And in order to check what we're doing, it's always good to have another layer right there um, that we are coloring um, with um, shift F5 in, you know, whatever, a medium gray kind of nice because we get to see what's happening. So we can kind of always control how is this image going to look like later on in some sort of form of presentation. So all of this took me about like I want to say a minute and we have a nice picture that looks a bit like a sketch which the clients also like a lot. You know they don't want to be hit over the head with like a photorealistic rendering. So that that would be too much for them in the beginning. You want to give them something that still has a bit of that sketch appeal right and if you want to go even further what I also like is control E. Control E is flattening everything minus that little layer back here. So you use either an eraser or you give it like a layer mask, uh, depending on how safe you're feeling. Today, I'm feeling very safe. I'm just using an eraser and um, you kind of control a little bit. You know, you give it a bit more sketch appeal by just simply taking out a bit of that information. And all of a sudden they think you have come up with a Photoshop rendering, but you didn't. And now if that client wants me to produce 20 versions all in different colors, then I will say yes to him because that person doesn't know that I can simply just you know, use my sliders and turn it into any kind of color I want to. So another um, trick here is usually start out with either red or orange, something you know, in that middle space of the color spectrum because then you have an easier time with your control U sliders to bring that into whatever color space you'd like to go to. And only the color will be affected. Anything in neutral tones, whites, blacks, and so forth, it's not gonna be touched. So you don't have to worry about that. So really cool, we have our first image done. And um, got to do some time check, 513. We still can play a little bit longer. Um, so obviously we wanna like model something real quick because the client didn't ask us for a plug. They wanted to have uh, some sort of scoundrel. So I'm starting out with um, something like this, a square with round corners, very simple. Then my center command bar is very quick at hand and I extrude this piece. Let's just get rid of the, the plug here for a moment and put things at the right places. So we wanna be on this layer right now. So uh, there it is, um, very ugly, um, not much going on. Um, so first thing that you could be doing is maybe you give this a radius. So level of complexity rising immediately. Wow, now it's been rounded. Wonderful. Now we cut this into pieces, um, you know, just chop it up because we're lazy. We only model one side, we don't model all the corners. Now we flip it around and my mirroring command is something uh, I couldn't live without. So here she is and we don't want to delete the, the bottom shape. Good, so we have our first shape and if you don't, don't like isoparms, you can get rid of them. Right with that little button right here, visible isoparms, so it's a little easier to see. And now we're gonna season it 
with a bit of line work. So we have that line still that we use for extrusion and we can now easily use it for an offset. So this would be offset and if you use uh, T enter, you will be able to like whatever, choose the value of offset that you like. Because we are in design mode, we are kind of like dreaming of something we're not sure yet. So we, we shouldn't use numbers, we just play around. Now we do that again, um, T enter, and we're gonna be able to like, you know, starting to do something here. So now I have two lines and my idea is maybe I'm gonna cut a window in here that I could either use for maybe a speaker or maybe a display. So we're gonna just simply select this whole thing. Then we're gonna go for trim it up against these two. And now that uh, middle piece here got separated, right? That's that's really the, the goal. And now of course I wanna have my isopalms back because without, without isopalms, it's really hard to grab anything. So we're just gonna grab this. Um, we'll delete this right now. We don't need it anymore. All great. Now I wanna show you something else. Um, cage edit is another one of those fancy commands. Um, first of all, I'm gonna throw my lines into my trash layer. I always have a trash layer for all that annoying stuff. Now, if we select this and we don't like the flatness, it looks very boring, looks like an engineer has done it. Uh, cage edit is wonderful. So this is how it looks like, cage edit. And you get to have a bunch of choices. I usually go for bounding box and then seaplane and a four point cage. And you say yes to that and it'll show up like this. So it's that wonderful gizmo with all these different stars and points and things. So now the only thing you have to be mindful of is select the ones you really wanna play with. And I'm going for a singular scale this function right there, so a scale 1D. And all I wanna do is I wanna blow up that roof a little bit, I wanna crown it a tiny bit. So if we do that and we use our center line that we just created because of the cutting, we can blow it up and all of a sudden it acts like a pillow, right? Wonderful, and that's all I wanted. Um, we can now throw away that cage, we don't need it anymore, done for. Now we wanna drop this a tiny bit. And you can see I'm, I'm really being fast, I'm being quick and dirty. I want to kind of scale this also with a 2D scale. I'm going to put it right here in the middle. If I was to be precise, I would have really tried to find that middle, but right now it's not precision, precision time. And if you learn that a hole down here is bothering you and you don't want it anymore, you know, that this, this was a mistake. So we have a big hole in there. How do we fix, fix that hole? Almost impossible with a three dimensional surface like that. There's this command, untrim, beautiful. And everything goes away and you have a nice, you know, baby Botox sort of surface, but at the top, you still have your wonderful design. Now we wanna close that chamfer real quick. We use the lofting command and we click and click. And there it is. So now this is what we got. Um, well, we should do it properly. And I'm um, gonna look at the clock. So I think we're still good. We can still play a little more because the real thing I wanna get to with you guys. So there we have it. And then if he, since everything was kind of coming from Rhino itself, I didn't really do much myself. Everything should still be very tight. So control J should join this all very nicely. Then with that, we should be successful applying some fillets, which sometimes can be the trick in Rhino. You know, Rhino is uh, not really the easiest. So five is gonna be too much because that radio is too tiny, the radius is too tiny. So let's just go for maybe a two and we might be lucky. No, we're not lucky yet because it's still things we wanna do five. So let's try it again. And two has been recognized, it's still too much. Well, we got away with it. The surfaces are not pretty but for a visualization process that we have in mind right now, good enough. That's all we kind of want to do, right? So that is sort of um, what we have now to play with. And our client wants a unit with a display on it. So we're going to give them a display that is kind of, kind of nice, um, you know, has a bit more features, making sure that other things aren't selected. And I'm still staying in one layer, right? Because I have to produce 20 of these and I only been given a day. So with the commands I've shown you earlier, I can now assign this particular piece of geometry 
with an object layer assignment. So I'm going to go instead of layer, I'm going to go to object. I'm going to find myself another one of those cool oxpecker images, clear black in that case. Wonderful. And layer two, I'm going to assign to, I just love that, that rubber material that they have. So environment maps, rubber, and there's that beautiful orange. I also love oranges for some reason. They're good, they're full of vitamins. So in the end, nothing has happened to this piece of geometry. And if we use shade, nothing else has happened. It's still quite boring, but if we use rendered, this thing should show up like a little box that has a shiny little surface in the middle and then is sort of rubberized on the sides, kind of like that. And then we already have modeled our plug. So this is kind of cool. I take my plug, pop it in, maybe in the middle, somewhere there. So, and then I check if it's sitting at the right places. It's not, so we'll move it up. And we have a believable piece of kit. Perfect. Now it's rendering season, but we don't want to use key shot. We use minus view capture. And our client wants a high res image. So this is now our squandle. How do you spell squandle? I don't know. Um, and we use a PNG with a transparent background. And again, we're going for our 6,000 by 6,000. Keep the scale, keep all of that, but make sure that transparent background is clicked on yes. And with that in mind, we can now count the seconds. This is gonna cost us about 30 seconds and we have a nice high res image without all the other crap in it. And with that, we're gonna go right back into Photoshop, open it up again. There she is, beautiful. Now we're gonna do this trick that I had shown you earlier, but I don't wanna do this because it takes too much time. So we can uh, just go for the, for the shadow maybe. So shadow was easy. We duplicate that layer. We gotta control U that layer in order to turn it into a black environment. And then we're gonna fuzzy up the edges with a Gaussian blur right there. Beautiful. And it's a little too dark. We add some transparency and box your uncle. Wonderful, and now the client wanted, of course, a display. So all we do now is we do this in Photoshop. We could have done it in Rhino, but um, we're gonna say 1241 on it. And somewhere there's my semicolon right here, 42, uh, time has passed. And um, we'll select it, give it some sort of, we want some orange, because uh, we love orange, and then we're going to turn it into a rasterized font because we want to mess around with it. Um, so rasterized type, then scale it up because it's too tiny at the moment. Nice. Um, move it over. Move that layer up to the top. And then uh, just a bit of, you know, transforming so that we actually kind of match the situation, you know, with those nice, um, so you use your control key and then you can grab all these nodes and just mess with them, put it on, got your time there. And if you wanna be fancy, you duplicate it and make it glow a little bit. Um, your client will be very happy about that. Again, with a bit of Gaussian blur seasoning. And also you wanna make that a little lighter so that it really has that sort of believable glow to it. You see how that light starts glowing? Beautiful. And that's all we wanna do right now because that's all they're paying for. Maybe we give them a bit more raising down here. And I still have a couple more minutes. Um, so like this, da -da -da -da. shadow goes away. Wonderful. Image is done and we just gonna crop it out. We don't wanna deal with all that other stuff. Image crop and we do the control E command, flatten everything because nobody needs those tons of layers. And that's it now. So we save this PNG as it is with our, and we save over the raw copy because we don't need to keep the raw image. Uh, it's worthless, not good. Anyway, that's half the story because we still have to build a presentation. 
because uh, without a presentation, it's not going to be a sellable image. Um, we're going to be asking 3000 bucks for it. We got to give our client at least a three page PDF or a one page PDF, um, however um, good we feel. So got to make sure you use a tool that's quick and easy. In this case, PowerPoint and people like in the design world, they hate PowerPoint, they frown upon it. Um, they love InDesign, but InDesign is a clunker because you have to think of the links and all of that good stuff. You have to suitcase everything. PowerPoint, you just throw everything in it. And if you're being a little nice to the typography, you can still have a good looking document, which doesn't cost you a thing. You don't have to buy a license of InDesign. So all I did here is I messed a little bit with that, um, with that background, um, I went into the slide master and massaged that background a tiny bit. So you can um, you know, look into background styles. I've given it a bit of a lens in the middle. So there's a, a gradient filled um, right there. Uh, you can do that any way you want to. But so consider that being done. I put my client name and some sort of project title to it. I made sure my copyright is given and um, you know, what sort of project is this? This is the Squandle project, so I put that in there. Now what's cool with my Rhino, I can very quickly also get my hands on some 2D drawing, right? So I have that geometry and here is that cool button, the little make a 2D drawing, which currently lives on a different screen, pardon me. I have to drag it over, hopefully not lose it. So you get all this, current view and it will create a nice 2D drawing for you. You don't have to do anything. Only trick, uh, sometimes those you know, lines that don't really have an edge, they kind of disappear. But we don't care about these lines. We just simply delete them because in the end, it's about adding another drawing into our PowerPoint to make it a little bit more palatable. So you've seen within a second, I have created this drawing and now I can save it out of Rhino, just select it, select the whole thing, save it out, export, select it as an AI file for Illustrator. You guys know Illustrator better than I do. So let's just um, find our folder here, case okay, state, and um, somewhere in here, test, there it is. So we have now an Illustrator file that can easily be handled with an Illustrator itself, or we can load it in Photoshop. We can uh, change line weight and whatnot. All I want is actually in the end, an image that I can add to my, to my um, to a three dimensional rendering. So I have my line work and it ends up being another PNG. We're probably not gonna see much of it because it's all, yeah, it's all white, but let's just load it into, into PowerPoint. So I have an area where I want to talk about dimensions with my client and we'll drop that in. Uh, this is uh, coming from over here, 2D drawing PNG. And there it is. Uh, it doesn't look like much, you know, but in the end, the idea is really just to have a bit of graphic noise, uh, you know, adding a bit to the information and also communicating the overall dimensions of my of my piece that I'm talking to them about. So we have a nice bit of line work. Um, and now, you know, obviously we don't have a logo on it, but for that we have PowerPoint. PowerPoint can, can um, do that for us. So we just simply type our client name. We can even draw a little box and pretend there's an LED here. Or if we wanted to, you know, put in our, our nice little, um, our nice little clock we just create a text box, um, 1242. And there she is, it should be a semicolon. And um, one of the fonts I really like a lot, but that's because I work for Dremel is Micro Gamma. Nice little digital looking font. I'm sure you guys have tons of um, cool fonts on your computers. So somewhere here, Micro Gamma lives, there she is. And it kind of, you know, becomes a believable sort of situation. And we turn that white as well. Oh, not that. I want to play with this button. Um, perfect. So we got our clock in there. We got some main dimensions in there. The only thing that's missing, usually these things, like they live on some sort of ground line. So we're dropping in a line. 
turn that line, uh, whatever, maybe white as well. So it becomes another piece. And also my cable becomes a piece of graphic in here that you know helps make that presentation a bit more interesting. Now I'm gonna go for my picture we just created within a couple minutes. And um, I believe we saved it. Where did we save it? Good question. Somewhere out here. Don't know, I'm, I've lost it. Um, no, I haven't, here it is. Beautiful. And because it's a PNG, it hovers nicely over everything else, right? So we can now freely compose our page. And now our client is obviously also very color hungry. So we do another control E and uh, control U in our Photoshop. We give them a bit of a, whatever, nice little lime green maybe or purple. Maybe this, maybe this is cool. This is what they wanted. So we'll save that again, squadron number two. And time check, 5.30. So we have about 20 minutes left for Q&A. Um, let's just finish this real quick. Put in another insert picture device and so forth. And because uh, we don't want it to be boring, this is like another option. You know, they can have it in yellow, but primarily we want to sell them orange. So here we go. This is our lead image, our hero. And then back here, maybe we turn this a little bit to fake a different geometry or a different perspective. Cool. And we're done. We have a slide that is presentable. We can send this out. And uh, of course, I was cheating a little bit. So I've created a few other things, um, you know, while I was kind of wondering about what I'm going to show you. So all of these pictures, and um, I have a real job, and during the real job, I don't have much time. It was a, I was able to cre create that quickly for you. And um, oftentimes, my clients are quite impressed by these images, and they haven't taken any time. I haven't rendered anything. I just really took some purposeful images as screenshots, went into Photoshop, massage them a tiny bit, and then put them into a presentation, and I'm ready to sell. Good, so this whole sequence took about 20 minutes, and you guys can, can do the same. You guys can really enhance the flavor of your presentations as you are trying to figure out designs, right? You can really play with these because they don't cost much energy. I'm gonna go, go back to the camera now because my little show and tell is pretty much done. Yep. There we are, and we're ready for a Q&A. So let me just find that button where I can stop sharing. There it is. Stop sharing, going back to the camera, and I think I'm back. And I'm ready for all the questions you have. I know this was a bit of a bombardment, um, and um, obviously you guys are on different levels, and some of you are masters and way better than me. Um, but what are the questions you guys have? And if not, I have like another five hours of materials that I can talk about. Well, we'll get started. Um, <laughs> one question that came in from uh, Gabby Fitterer, and I will hopefully be able to, yeah, share this. Uh, how long does the entire process for projects like this typically take? Like a project like that, if we really are doing it um, for real, I mean, that, that beginning, this was not fake. This is what we really would do. And we would uh, try having early conversations with the client. But usually a, a program for us, a short program can be two weeks. A long program can be three years. It really depends on how far the client wants to go with it. Like, obviously, we haven't talked about, you know, preparing something like that for production. And in our case, we are equipped from going from a very humble hand sketch all the way into tooling data. Uh, in China where the production plant happens. So um, it can easily take a year, year and a half to really bring something to the production line. But these days clients, sometimes they just need marketing support. They wanna go to Home Depot, they wanna show some fancy pictures to a merchant. All of a sudden they come to us and they ask us, hey, can you visualize this for us? And that might be the end of the project. So, you know, not to take the uh, Kansas analogies too far, but I mean, I feel like we just got behind the curtain. The wizard just like pulled the curtain, you know, back. You know, your whole presentation was really just kind of showing us kind of exactly the kind of uh, all the tricks in the of the trade, which is awesome. Bit of a teaser. Um, yeah, no, exactly. That's great. 
The, uh, I was wondering in, in this process, is, do you have like a, a favorite part that you just kind of, that's, that's your, you know, jam and, and, uh, and, and how does that, how do you, are you able to do that very often? Yeah, I guess naturally for where I'm coming from, the drawing aspect, the really the, the, the dreaming up of shapes on piece of paper or digitally, that's really what I, what I die for. Like I, I need to draw, this is who I am. But um, as I became more and more fluent in 3D modeling, it's that, that cool thing, you can actually not turn this into at least a virtual reality, right? So once you have drawn it, you, you almost want to model it. In my position, it's a little more difficult because I'm here to run a studio, to, to manage um, projects and clients and also to make sure that everybody has something on their plate. So I don't get to do that too often, but in the upfront of a project, when we have these early conversations with clients, that's really when my, my drawing muscle um, helps me a great deal because I employ it every time and uh, clients immediately give you feedback when I have that call and they sometimes, you know, they come from a different planet, from a different continent. Um, language is always a, a problem. And I might not pick up everything I'm hearing, but as soon as they start seeing something visually, it becomes a conversation point. And, and that's really the powerfulness of, of drawing. Maybe while, while I'm blabbering, I, I can also point my camera down at my sketchbook and we can kind of maybe browse through it a little bit on the side while more questions are coming through the door. So this is also not fakery, you know, this, this is my, my true sketchbook and I need to kind of go fast over those pages because some of that stuff is really still confidential. But um, as you can see, you know, there's hardly any notes, it's only visual notes. Um, and I'm planning projects for my folks so that we know what we are to be working on and what we can actually sell to our client, right? So these sketches, they don't have to be complete and fanciful as long as they convey what the client is looking for, you know, we're like working on uh, bathroom items right now and uh, different environments, but sometimes I'm also having fun. I'm going out in the field and I'm just, you know, I'm seeing something cool, especially here in America. I'm a, I'm a tourist. So I get to, I get to have fun by just sketching something or, you know, I was thinking of masks and I thought like, who are the actual users of a mask these days? It's the 60, 70, 80 year olds. It's not the, the beautiful people, you know, that, that wear masks because they want to make a fashion statement. No, it's really got to be done for that kind of user group. So I'm, I'm actively thinking through a task with these sketches and with these books because I need to be able to brief somebody else upon what I've heard from somebody. And this helps a great deal, you know, especially nowadays, I, everything is being shared with my peers. Everybody works from home. So I'm constantly sitting here giving them advice by just scribbling into their sketches or making my own 3D little sketch of something. You know, we've, we've investigated packaging for like literally for food. So we have to kind of analyze what, what's that made of. Anyway, I don't want to like um, kill the day by now. I have other hour. questions now coming in. They're, they're starting to flood in. So I'm going to start. Uh, Megan Radcliffe is asking, what is the best way to include sketching in a portfolio? O only process for the projects you're showing or a collection of process work, even if the final product isn't shown? No, we definitely prefer to see exactly that kind of raw stuff that I've just shown you. So if you would apply here at Teams, of course, we would expect some sort of website and some kind of polished kind of portfolio. Um, but if you bring a sketchbook along or a pile of sketches, it doesn't matter what format it is, you know, it could be anything that will show us the true way of how you think and whether or not you can think through a project. You know, I, I don't necessarily need to see that you handled Photoshop really well and cleaned up a sketch to a point where it's no longer a sketch. I mean, that's also a skill. That's a good skill to have. But when it comes to showing your creative muscle, it's good to include things outside of your portfolio that are more of that rough nature because you really get to learn about a person. And usually don't, don't uh, make the sketches fall short. Oftentimes I see portfolios and there's 30 pages and then there's about like one slide in there that shows the sketches and the sketch selection process all within that one slide. I mean, that's such a massive piece of energy that has been spent to make that project work, why sell it short, right? So include more than less. 
uh, and maybe the analysis part sometimes in those portfolios is huge. I mean, people telling me the entire world of information. And then in the end, all of a sudden there's a design project. And, and so the emphasis matters, right? I mean, we are designers or we are architects or interior architects. We got to really kind of focus on what we are really truly doing. We're not analysts. We're not researchers, not in a scientific sense anyway. So that's the kind of message that I would give to people. Like, you know, show me your, the artistic muscle you guys have and also the creative brain you guys are like, living with. That's, that's key. Hope that answers the question. Yeah, the, the next one, uh, Andreas, is from uh, Evan Sedlicek. Uh, it's a little more technical. What are the specs of your PC or do you think specs really impact your workflow in a significant way? Oh my way? goodness. Um, now I would have to really kind of, like, first of all, I, I'm really not an IT guy. I, I find myself a pretty good user of my tools, but as soon as I need to give somebody information about what my specs are, I could pull my, I guess, my info chart here on my machine, but even that is like requires stinking on my end. I mean, we have powerful graphics cards in there. I'm hearing G4s, but you know, <laughs> I, I need to find somebody else who can answer that question <laughs> in the studio. Um, well, Maybe I should move on to another question. There's a, quite a few coming perhaps, in. Perhaps. Uh, Dustin yeah. McDermott, um, right. could we focus on mastering one modeling program or do we need to know Fusion 360 or Rhino inside and out? So definitely a no to inside and out. I myself been using Rhino for probably 15 years and certain buttons and areas I have never ever ventured into. So an absolute no to that. It's always good, especially as a student, to kind of tap into many tools to sort of see, hey, this tool is cool for me. I like that workflow. This tool sucks because the programming might be challenging. And people find their, their place, you know? But in our case, I would advise, you know, a program like Fusion 360 gives you a bit of everything, which is good because surface modeling will allow you to be quick and dirty. You don't have to be tight unless you want to print like 3D print. As long as you're still trying to figure things out, you can be absolutely loose as long as it's good for visualization. And you will still get some sort of dimensional understanding. And then if you really want to go to town and produce something that's manufacturable, you want to have a parametric modeler. So SolidWorks, or Solid Edge, or Fusion 360 is parametric in certain areas. So, so that's a good tool to have because you can go back and forth. Um, but yeah, you don't have to be a master in any of these tools and um, just tap into a few to check them out. And Rhino is a pretty stable and also it can be clean of a tool, um, you know, as long as you kind of know it's quirks. So sometimes mathematically it pretends that, that something is cool and it's not, um, but for our purpose, it's a good tool to have because it's fast and you know, get some quality out of it and less complicated in comparison to Alias, for instance. Um, 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 does that help? <laughs> I hope it does. Oh, it's great. Um, from Tyler Hilk, how do you stand out to your clients, employers in a student position? Do we just make engaging portfolios and boast academics or focus more elsewhere? I'm not sure if I fully follow the question. Is it about how to approach us with portfolios? Yeah, or? I think so. I think they're really wondering kind of what, what they really should focus on, um, you know, do the, does, does academics matter or is it really portfolios the only thing or is there some you know, other? I mean, in the end, we are still in a visual business. Like we, we are basically, we're sculptors and we're visualizers, we're visionaries. So academia is good. You know, I'd like to know if somebody has a cool math degree or knows how to weld or for instance, uh, language skills should definitely be mentioned because that's, that's huge in terms of tapping into different cultures and doing ethnographic research. If you have Spanish under your wings or you can speak Russian fluidly, beautiful. You know, that's the reason why I got my first job because my English skills were given. Um, never sell short any kind of um, IT skills like modeling skills, whatever visualization program you've been using. It doesn't matter how big it is, what sort of name brand it is. Um, those things you definitely have to mention. I don't necessarily care about your GPA or like how, how good you were at math 101 at the university level. I don't care about it. As long as you can kind of tell me uh, that an inch has 25.4 millimeters, 
that's a good thing to know. Um, but that's the kind of math we're dealing with, right? X, Y, Z, and a bit of percentage, right? I, I don't have to integrate or differentiate or do all that sort of business. That other people will do that for me, right? I will work with engineers who understand that. And that's kind of what I want to give everybody. Everyone should relax. You know, later on, when you're out in the field, you will be part of a team, regardless if you are a freelancer or if you are hired in some company. You will not have to lift this all by yourself. Nice. The, another question from Hannah at Klippenstein. Uh, what do you suggest as busy students to help us better our skills in sketching on paper and on the computer outside of the projects they're doing in studio? Definitely look into the things you truly enjoy in life. You know, and I am a car boy. I, I loved anything that moves ever since I was a kid. And nobody has to force me to draw that sort of subject matter. But I also enjoy watching people on the train. I used to be riding the L every day. Nowadays, I don't because of COVID. But whenever I have a chance, I see somebody and that person doesn't detect me, I will be sure to have a little scribble made. So I have dedicated sketchbooks. Uh, one's for cars at home. And the other one is for people. And Sometimes I catch a hand, sometimes I catch the full person because the person then after 30 seconds moves along. But that's kind of cool because these people don't know what you're doing and they will constantly be moving about. So you are forced to just look for that gesture. And that's key, right? You, you, you kind of collect with your eyes a certain gesture. It's not about the details. It's about, you know, is it tall? Is it wide? Is it crooked, curve, bulbous? Um, but it doesn't matter if, if there were flowers on the skirt. You know, you won't have the time for that. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. Um, and really, like, um, I had a project at the beginning of the year. Post-its are phenomenal because it's a tiny real estate. It's nine inches square. And um, you can put, like, an entire universe onto those post-its, right? It really is just a matter of what kind of pen you're using. And if you are happen to be in, like, a Math 101 or a Biology 101 lesson and it gets a little over your head, start doodling, you know, use that time and doodle your right or left arm out of your, out of your body. That's awesome. Good advice. Uh, Practice I mean, never stops. So far is um, from Jacob Kim. Uh, what would you say your design philosophy is? Has your approach to design changed over the years? Oh boy. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it, it must have changed over the years because I, I started seeing a lot more things, you know, and um Obviously, the, the longer you do this, the more you learn about processes and you know what can and cannot be done and, and the kinds of workarounds. So that, that shapes you and that influences the way you design something. Sometimes it also starts limiting you because you've seen too many things failing and then you don't even dare. So I think a student is better off because they can, they can just be flamboyant in their design vision. And, and that's what's important about uh, like a thesis project, for instance, you can really make this, bring this to life and it can be a vision. It doesn't have to be producible. But in our case, we always have to make it happen. It has to be producible, oftentimes in a mass scale. From a philosophy point of view, I was born in Germany and the closer I got to design, obviously I've, I've been reading quite a few Bauhaus books. Um, my, my school I was studying at was near the Bauhaus. So that sort of magnetism, that kind of magic was in the air, right? And you start understanding, you know, when you fold a piece of paper all of a sudden that piece of paper can stand and there was no scissor and no glue involved, that's magical. And, and that's what the Bauhaus did to people. They, they made them understand properties of materials and what goes together and what doesn't. And, and you know, that yin and yang of, of things. So that kind of magic and, and compassion, you have to kind of sniff out for yourself. And really it doesn't matter if, if you like sports shoes or if you like fruit or if it is curtains uh, that you want to hang any subject is cool as long as it intrigues you and, and really drives you without someone else telling you to do it that's great um i guess i have one last question um you know when you're you you mentioned uh, several times this idea that design mm -hmm. is really coming not from an individual but from a team and I guess I, 
I ask you, like, you're you're now the leader of of these teams, and is is there something? Um, what's the challenge of, of that, of, of, of working within a team, of being a good team member? Uh, what And what advice might you give to students that maybe don't really understand that dynamic? Yeah, I think uh, being in a team is always, a, it's, it's definitely a good thing because I can re rely on other powers that I might not have. And at some point I understood for myself that certain skills I will never ever have. I might know about them, but I, I will not be able to make them mine. You know, in the beginning I thought web design was also something I have to put into my head, but then 3D modeling became so involved. So, you know, one thing kind of faded away, the other thing became stronger. And so this is how we share skills. And um, what's really kind of important is that everybody kind of appreciates the, the very skill that they can offer to that bigger thing. You, you shouldn't be ashamed by not knowing something. You should be happy and glorious about the things you do know that somebody else might not know, right? So, and that's, that's really worth gold because that keeps you sane. Because design is also very subjective. It can be, you know, some people, they, they are in tears after a critique, but it's a matter of how critiques being shared, you know, is it done fairly? Is it, is it really moving a project forward? So if I critique our, our folks, I try to show them a counter example. You know, I try to ask myself, could I do something better or different as an offer for them to pick it back up again and to redo it? And that is my job. I have to be involved in these projects to a point where I can say, all right, if, if everything fails and if somebody gets sick, I need to be able to still deliver. And so you have to be able to rely on your teammates. And I ask people really, if you save your files, save them neatly because somebody else may have to pick them up and may have to continue to work on this because you are gonna be busy working on something else. So you have to keep that constant timeline in your head, these many different timelines of those projects. And you try to see, all right, is this person available? Because that's the right kind of task for that person that fits beautifully for what they can do. But then you take this away from them again because another task is asked by the client. So you put somebody else in it. So we have one videographer, for instance. Nobody else could be doing videography here in the studio but that person. And then we have strong modelers, but we also have strong sketchers. And so it kind of like a project sees many different people at certain times. Um, so that in the end, we are successful to the client. And, you know, I'm the captain of the ship, of this ship, not of entire teams. You know, I'm just of the American ship. But that means I'm also the firewall. So the, the client can complain to me. They will never complain directly to my folks because I'm going to, you know, leave that or keep that away from this creative environment because I don't want to have any kind of mud fight or, or tears. You know, that's the last thing I want. I want this to be a happy bunch because only with happiness we can make beautiful design. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. And if I feel sick or something, I, I cannot be creative. Sorry, I, I don't know if I'm really oh, giving I, the right kinds of answers. Well, Steve, that, that, that's a great um, note to end on, the, the, to make a happy, creative environment. And that's what we're all trying to do. So uh, I, I want to thank you, Andreas. It's been, it's been great to get to know you and to get to uh, get your expertise Likewise. here. You know, it's been it's been a pleasure. So thank you all to uh, for being part of this uh, first Ekdal lecture, and uh, thank you again, Andreas Bell. Absolutely, my pleasure, and uh, good luck to all the students and to all you professors. I mean, it's a trying time, but we're going to make it through it, and um, you'll be really good creative people. So believe in yourself and dream big. Great. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.